All right, honors biology. Um, today I want to kind of give you the second part of this lecture um, that we started previously about classifying living things. Uh, we, we talked in the previous lecture about the six kingdoms of living things. So like everything that's alive, you know, we can kind of put it into one of six different categories, right? Either an animal or a plant or you know, fungus, protus, etc. Uh, but today we're going to talk a little bit about how we can further classify things. I mean, kingdoms are kind of general, you know, like for example, animals. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of different types of animals. I mean, there's, you know, I don't know, there's hundreds of thousands of different species of plants. I mean, there's just tons of these things. So each one of those kingdoms again, it's kind of a general grouping that we put things in. But, you know, if we really want to get good at classifying, we have to kind of further break things up, you know, into some smaller groups. You know, it's like if you went to a grocery store, you know, there's not just like one category of food. There's like multiple categories, right? You've got like, you know, the produce section and the dairy section and the frozen food section, you got all these different areas of a grocery store that makes it easy for us to, uh, you know, go and identify things and find things. Well, same thing with organizing living things. I mean, the more kind of groups we have, the easier it is to kind of place things. So what we're going to look at today is kind of the seven different groupings of how we classify living things. And I'm going to list them here for you. And we're going to kind of go through them individually and, and kind of classify a human being into these seven levels. Um, and we're going to start at the very top with like the most general level of all, which is the kingdom. I think we know what kingdom we belong to, right? We belong to the animal kingdom. But there's a lot of different types of animals out there. So we have to kind of further take the animal kingdom and break it down into some some smaller groups. That's those are called phylums. You know, phylums are basically smaller groups of animals. Now, the phylum that we belong to is called a chordate. We're going to talk today about what chordates are and what some of the characteristics are that they have. But even you know, phylums are are still kind of big groups. So we have to break them down into smaller groups. They're called classes. Now, the class that we belong to is called a mammal, and we talked a little bit this week already about some of the traits of mammals, and we'll talk more about those today. Then we get into orders. The order that we belong to is called a primate. You've probably heard of that before. The family, we break it down even further. So we're getting more and more specific as we go down. The family that we belong to is a hominid. So we have to have certain characteristics that make us hominids. Then we get into the genus and the species. If you look at those two terms there, homo sapien, that's kind of what makes up our scientific name, you know, for human beings. And we'll talk about what makes us human, you know, as we go through the year. You know, there's some distinct things that, that, that make that. So I want to go through some of these terms with you. Now, before we, we get into them, um, you know, they, they, they sometimes have these little mnemonics that kind of help you kind of remember, you know, some of the orders of some of these terms. So if you're trying to remember just the general names of the levels of classification, I use this mnemonic here. It's called King Philip came over for good soup. So if you remember that, the first letter of each one of those words represents the different terms. Uh, and then if you want to remember what group we actually belong to, all cats must prove honey has sugar. So that way you can see here that you know animal is all, you know the capital A chordate for C, et cetera, et cetera. So if you remember those sentences and maybe it'll help you remember these but the bottom line is you need to know these okay so you know for the first test is coming up soon so we have to know these for the first exam all right so let's kind of go through them individually and just kind of understand again what makes us an animal you know we talked about this yesterday in the notes you know what makes us an animal is that we're eukaryotic we don't have any cell walls we have cell membranes uh, we'll talk more about that when we get into cells you know, we're multicellular. There's no unicellular animals. And we're heterotrophic. You know, that's pretty much what makes us an animal. The thing is, lots of organisms fit into this category. 
I mean, a jellyfish. A jellyfish is eukaryotic. You know, they don't have any cell walls. They're multicellular and they're heterotrophs. So they automatically fit into the animal kingdom. So, you know, there, you can see that there's a lot of diversity when it comes to animals, because this is really all animals need to be considered animals. Now we get down in, into the phylum. You know, the phylum that we belong to is called a chordate. You know, chordates are animals but they're unique types of animals. Okay, chordates are animals that have what we call a flexible rod, also known as a notochord, along the dorsal side or the back side at some point in their life. You know, in humans, the notochord is our vertebrae. It's our vertebral column, that, you know, our backbone, okay? In other animals, it's you know, not made of, but like in a shark, it's made of cartilage. So it's like a little bit of a different structure, but all animals have that. A nerve cord. Now, there's a difference between the notochord and the nerve cord. You know, the, the, the notochord, which is our backbone, is what protects the nerve cord. The nerve cord runs along the inside of the notochord. You know, so those are two distinct things, but all chordates have those at some point in their life. Another thing that all chordates have is what we call pharyngeal slits. Now, pharyngeal slits are kind of hard to explain, but I'll, I'll show this to you in a minute. I think I have a, I don't know if I have a picture or not of it. But pharyngeal slits are basically primitive gills. You know, they they form in the embryo stage. Like humans, when we're embryos, when we're like you know seven, eight, ten weeks old. We don't have lungs yet. We have these things called pharyngeal slits along the kind of the head region of our body. But as we develop, we lose those things. They, like in humans, we lose those pharyngeal slits as we develop into a baby and we develop lungs. But in other animals, they, they turn into gills. Like in fish, the fish are chordates. They actually, those pharyngeal slits actually turn into uh, functioning gills. So but again, at some point in life, we have those things. Then finally, a tail. You know, now humans, you don't think of us as having tails, but again, in the embryonic stage, we actually do have very primitive tails. And as the embryo develops, we lose that tail. Eventually, it, it recedes and turns into um, our part of our backbone. You know, but we have that at some point in life. You know, all of these animals. You know, I don't care. Um, you know what it is but i mean some animals don't have the features that chordates do you know jellyfish jellyfish don't have backbones at some point in their life you know neither do earthworms neither do um, slugs or snails you know insects insects do not have the same traits so these are all invertebrate animals invertebrates don't have the same traits that chordates do so not every animal is a chordate but some animals are chordates. I mean, birds are chordates, fish are chordates, lizards and reptiles are chordates. Here's kind of an interesting one here. It's called a, this is called a sea squirt. You've probably never seen one. You probably never will. Most sea squirts, you can probably hold them in the palm of your hand. They live in the ocean. What you're looking at in this picture, this is the adult form of the sea squirt. When they're adults, they don't have any of the traits that chordates have. They don't have a backbone and a notochord and all those things. But when they're embryos, they're actually mobile. They can swim. And when they're embryos, they actually have the notochord and the dorsal nerve cord and all of those traits that chordates have. But once they form into an adult, they lose all those traits. But since they have them at some point in their life, we characterize them as chordates. They're kind of an interesting organism. All right, now mammals. You know, this is the class that we belong to. You know, mammals are chordates. They all have hair or fur. They all have mammary glands to nurse their young. They have what we call a four-chambered heart, which makes it very efficient to pump blood. There's no hearts more efficient than a four-chambered heart. We have those, you know, whales have them. Whales are mammals. They have, we have what we call an internal body temperature regulation. We're, we're what we call endothermic. 
So like our body temperature is always maintained at the same level, you know, 98.6. If there's any alteration to that, it's an indication that something is wrong inside the body. So, you know, when you go to the doctor, they check your temperature. If it's 102 degrees, they know that that's not the normal endothermic temperature that our body should have. So mammals actually can, can do that. We have that internal, it's all homeostatic. We talk about that in class. We also have lungs. You know, all mammals have lungs to breathe, okay? So that gives us those mammalian traits. These are all mammals. Not every animal is a mammal, though. Fish, not mammals. Uh, when it comes to mammals, there's typically three different groups. We have what we call the monotremes, which are what we call egg-laying mammals. We have the marsupials, which are your pouched animal, your pouched mammals. And then we have the placentals, which... Um, you know, believe it or not, most mammals are placentals. Um, you know, when it comes to a placental, you know, the baby is attached to a placenta, which is what connects the baby to the mother. Uh, and then once the baby is born, you know, it's separated from the placenta. But that's what allows nutrients to pass to the baby through the umbilical cord. Again, most mammals are placental mammals, which it, it, it gives the mammal or it gives the offspring the best chance of survival. So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then we have primates. You know, primates, when you think of a primate, you probably think of like gorillas and orangutans and monkeys, and that's true. Um, primates have what we call binocular vision, uh, which basically means that, you know, our eyes face forward. We can see in three dimensions. And that's probably a really important thing for, you know, a lot of primates that swing through trees and kind of knowing where that next tree would be, you would think binocular vision would probably be a really important thing, but we also have that. Long, flexible fingers and toes. You know, we also have what we call an opposable thumb. Believe it or not, you know, the ability to do this, you know, grab things with our thumb is a very unique trait to the animal kingdom. Only primates have this. You know, your dog can't do that. He can't grab something with his thumb. You know, when we when we write with a pencil, you know, think about what we you know, tr try writing without the use of a thumb. You know, it'd be very difficult to do. You know, there's some very simple tasks. You know, try tying your shoes without the use of your thumb. All right, so having an opposable thumb is actually a really important adaptation for, for primates. Rotating shoulders. Again, the ability, you know, to, to do this. But just to rotate our shoulder like this is something that is very rare in the animal kingdom. Then finally, a well-developed cerebrum. The cerebrum is a part of the brain, and we'll talk about it later on in the year. That's, you know, it, it's what gives us, you know, capabilities of, of, of problem solving and you know, complex thought and decision making. You know, it's a really well-developed part of our brain. Other animals have cerebrums but they're not as well developed as they are in the primate brain. So it makes these animals much more intelligent compared to others. So again, here we have our primates. Now, finally, uh, we're gonna stop with this today. It's, it's the hominid. You know, hominids are basically primates that walk upright. You know, we are, human beings, are the only bipedal primates. The bipedal means walking on two legs. Now, a chimpanzee and a gorilla can walk on two legs, but it's not their primary method of locomotion. You know, gorillas and monkeys are what we call knuckle walkers. They walk on all fours. That's their primary method of locomotion. There's reasons why that is, and we'll talk about it more second semester. But as far as hominids go, you know, they're, they're, they're primates that walk upright. And we are the only ones on the planet that can actually do that, which gives, some, gives us some very unique um, capabilities. All right. So again, just kind of, you know, kind of summarizing this up a little bit. You know, here we have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. These are our, our groupings. We're going to leave these last two out for today. We're going to talk more about them uh, next semester when we get into evolution of humans and things like that. But, but right now, I do want you to know, again, the seven different categories. I, wa I want you to know the names of the groups that we belong to. You should know what kingdom humans belong to, what phylum, what class, what order, family, genus, and species we belong to. 
All right, I just threw some other organisms in here just to kind of look at, you know, chimpanzee, a pig, a goldfish, and a jellyfish. I mean, if you just look at, at the kingdom, we're all animals. All five of those organisms are animals because we share those animal traits, right? Eukaryotic and heterotrophic and all that stuff. Then we get into the phylum, right? The phylum is chordate. You know, jellyfish are of these five animals. They're the only ones that aren't a chordate. So you need to ask yourself, why is that? Why are jellyfish not chordates? Why are all of these other animals chordates? Because they have chordate traits. Class, we belong to the mammal, mammal class. So do chimps, so do pigs, but not goldfish and definitely not jellyfish. The order, we are primates, so are chimps. Pigs are not primates, right? Pigs don't have the opposable thumb. Pigs don't have the rotating shoulders, that type of thing. The family we belong to is hominid. And as far as hominids go, that's where the comparison stops with all of these other organisms. Okay, so make sure we can kind of understand this chart I think it kind of makes a lot of sense after you, after you look at it. All right, very last thing today um, is what we call scientific naming. A scientific naming is a system that we use so that scientists from around the world can communicate with each other when it comes to the names of organisms. I mean, like, you know, this organism here, you know, we would call it a dog, right? I mean, you know, that's what we would call it. But, you know, if you lived in... If you spoke Spanish, for example, you would call it a perro. If you were German, you would call it a hund. You know, I mean, if you were French, you would call it a chien. So I may, I may be mispronouncing those because I don't speak those languages. But anyway, I mean, these are the, the same four words that are used to describe the same organism. So, you know, how is a... German veterinarian and a French veterinarian going to communicate with each other if they don't speak the same language, right? It's very difficult to do that. So instead, what we use is a scientific name. And the scientific name for this animal here is Canis familiaris. This is a term that I don't care if you're a French veterinarian or a German veterinarian or a Spanish veterinarian or an English veterinarian. If you hear that term, you know exactly what organism we're talking about. Now, this two-name naming system comes from the genus and the species name. So, for example, for humans, right, I mean, we would be considered, you know, Homo sapien, right, because that is our genus name and our species name. But every organism is different. You know, a dog, you know, Canis familiaris, Canis is the genus name, familiaris is the species name. You know, Felis domesticus. Felis domesticus is a house cat. You know, a Felis leo is a lion. Felis tigris is, you don't have to memorize all of these. The only one that I want you to know right now is Homo sapien. That's our scientific name. But when you are writing a scientific name or typing a scientific name, there are some rules that I want you to follow. Okay, first of all, the first name, the genus name, always is capitalized. The first letter always capitalized. You know, when I was in high school, or when I was in college, I should say, I had a professor that uh, graded a paper of mine, um, and he gave me an F, all because I didn't um, write, type in the scientific names correctly of the organisms that we were studying. And I, I freaked out. And of course, he changed it after I went back and you know, made the corrections, but... I mean, you know, it, it got serious.